Welcome back. You're still watching Smart Money on CNBC TV 18. And this is a part of our Outstanding Women in Finance series where we're profiling women who have done their bit and have achieved it all in their arena. Today, of course, we have Jyotsna Singh of uh, Kotak Private Wealth with us. Uh, Jyotsna, you know, you were telling us before the break about how your, um, your investment mistakes or, you know, your investment lessons, right? Yeah. Uh, you told us you need to stay invested, you need to stay patient and that's the most important thing. What else? What else would you advise our viewer today? So, uh, you know, another important thing to keep in mind really is uh, know your own world. And, you know, uh, let me just sort of remind you of that famous story that we've all heard of when we were probably growing up about, uh, you know, Ganesh ji uh, getting into a race with his brother Karthike. And, uh, you know, they decided to have this race and, and uh, his brother, of course, went around the world three times and uh, Ganesh ji just went around his parents three times and won the race. I think the clear messaging from that is know your world, know your goals, know your risk appetite, know your gumption to, uh, you know, to, to, or to stomach uh, risk, etc. And don't get bothered by what people are doing around you. I think somewhere we get really spitten by what others are doing around it. So don't worry about the Joneses. Stay focused mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, once again, just sort of stay the course. And then, of course, you don't have to really burn your, uh, you know, or touch the fire to sort of feel the heat, as they say, uh, because just keep observing what others are doing, uh, learn from their mistakes, sometimes see what they're doing, sometimes see what they're not doing, and uh, don't be in a rush to sort of jump onto the bandwagon, etc. and clearly no FOMO. You know, yeah. And that's a, that's something that we've really seen a lot of happening of late. So I think that's something we should be careful about. Okay. Just mm. if I could sum up and say that one of the most important things, if you ask me, is the quality that you should have when you're, uh, you know, wanting to do investments. And more than intellect, I would say um, it is the temperament. Have a calm temperament. Ha you know, just stay cool about it. Ups and downs are, you know, bound to come. That's the reality of the markets. But uh, just hang in there and stay focused. I'm stay very calm. interested to know what is your own investment style? Because, you know, this is a very dynamic market. It's sure. hard to find uh, sectors which stay the course, right? I mean, because of disruption, digitization, things are changing on the go. Um, what is your investment style and how are you approaching the markets now? Well, my own personal style is, um, I'd say, very vanilla. Now, I know that, you know, vanilla is often uh, misunderstood or understood to be plain, boring. simple, boring, very rightly said, right? Maybe, maybe very safe and unexciting. But uh, since you mentioned boring, let me just say that, uh, you know, to quote an ice cream expert on the word vanilla, uh, you know, he said it's a stunningly sort of complex uh, and, and subtle spice, in fact, you know, it's one of the most expensive, I think, the second most expensive. But anyway, coming back to investments, uh, for me, the uh, the vanilla part of investment, uh, you know, is, is sticking to the approach of asset allocation. I think that is really the cornerstone, and I'm a huge believer in it. And interestingly, enough and more studies have been done that demonstrate that over long periods of time, when you look at what has contributed to portfolio performance or portfolio returns, more than more than 90% plus has actually come in because of just sticking to the discipline of asset allocation. Now, asset allocation, as the name suggests, is, is no rocket science. It's about just you know, sticking to uh, how you want to diversify across various asset classes. Um, and uh, having said that, however simple and however vanilla this might sound, the reality is uh, and I can also speak for myself, it's really difficult to actually adhere to it in a disciplined fashion. Sometimes it's just lack of time. Sometimes it's you just get a little emotional about, I, you know, I bought something and, uh, and, and all sorts of, you know, uh, uh, colorings come into your judgment. And but that is why... let me ask you this. Sure. Let me ask you this. Sorry to interrupt, but, no. you know, I want to ask you, when you talk about vanilla, right? What is the basic fundamental of your investment journey? Do you prefer buying, say, you know, just going with a uh, large cap basket buying in terms of stocks? Do you prefer putting all your money in ETFs, index funds? Uh, do you, you know, like a little more aggression with mutual funds? Because we do know that at the end of the day, mutual fund managers, they have not outperformed the index funds, right? They yeah. haven't outperformed the benchmark. I mean, that's the, that's the truth. So how, do you, how are you approaching it? You know, um, so uh, I think it's a very pertinent question you've asked, and that is why I was saying that when you stick to asset allocation, 
once you're clear on that, and you know, asset allocation could depend on one's own age, goals, risk appetite. I keep harping on risk appetite because, again, uh, you know, yours could be absolutely different from mine. But having said that, one can either do that one, you know, by one's own self in terms of constructing the portfolio. But these days, there are very interesting platforms that are available. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, I'm a huge believer in using those platforms where they are actually asset allocators for you. So once you give them your risk profile, they will go ahead and do, you know, once they know, for example, that if you're an aggressive investor, they could do an 80-20 for you, et cetera. And then they will decide whether it, how much should go into active, how much should go into passive. You talked about ETFs, which would be, you know, in the passive part, part of it. Uh, how much should really go into large caps? How much should go into... So it's all taken care of. And the beauty is that very often we don't stick to uh, asset allocation or the discipline because, like I said, time constraints, we get a little, uh, you know, uh, yeah, emotional sure. about stocks. Whereas here, it's done as a process, you mm -hmm. know, that's the bread and butter living and it's uh, very clinical. So uh, I would, you know, I'm a big believer in going to the platforms and, and allowing them to do it for you. Do and I know thing. many people would say, oh my God, you're a finance professional doing it yourself. But it's true, F professionals don't have that much time to, to do, know, focus, do it themselves. Yeah. And I, of course, I understand. I feel the same, exactly the same. I mean, you know, you can leave it to the professionals who do sure. it daily, right? Why do you have to do it when you have other things yeah. uh, on your plate? Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, your lessons, right? Because you have had a career of over 35 years. I'm sure you've met a lot of stakeholders of the industry whether it's market guys, corporates, and I'm sure you had some mentors, some role models as well. Who has your role model been, Jyotsna, and uh, what is your biggest learning from them? You know, um, there are many investment gurus and, and, of course, domain experts that one has learned from a lot. Uh, many colleagues in the industry and within the workplace that one has gained immense uh, insights from. But since you specifically asked from an investment perspective, I would say for me um, personally, you know, someone, someone that has done both wealth creation uh, and more would be a sort of a role model. And for me, that would be the house of Tata's because, you know, someone who's actually been in the real economy and has managed to touch the lives of so many people, the kind of job creation that's happened, the kind of impact they've had on society, uh, the kind of you know reforms that have come in because of them, whether it's land reforms, whether it's uh, labor reforms uh, and social reforms, et cetera, they have made such a deep impact. And at the same time, they have generated wealth. So I think it's a win-win. You know, somewhere there is this debate that happens even when you talk about sustainability, et cetera, that can businesses be profitable if you need to be sustainable? And I think the two are absolutely interlinked. And, uh, uh, you know, the Tatas are such an awesome group to look up to uh, and see it. And if also, you know, uh, if you look at uh, if you look at the numbers uh, in terms of uh, how their stocks have done and you compare it um, you know there's enough and more data again out there but about a 25 26 year 26 year analysis uh, comparing some stocks across germany japan us leading countries and and then of course uh, you know uh, warren buffet's own hathaway uh, uh, enterprise um, and then uh, the tatas uh, the numbers clearly stack up in favor of the tatas over longer periods of oh, time that's great uh, okay. so you know point being they've done well financially that basket of tata companies and um, and yet they've done so much good for society. So my vote would go to them. Okay, your vote would go to them. We have just a couple of minutes left. So let me ask you for a viewer who's, you know, perhaps watching you right now, looking for their own investments and to grow their corpus. You spoke about uh, being patient and, you know, investing in this market, being consistent with your investments. Sure. Uh, in terms of asset allocation, do you believe that for someone who's young, say between their 20s and 30s, does it make sense to diversify outside equities? You know, because this is a time where interest rates are also on the rise. Uh, in fact, Fixed income, there's, there's a lot of interest now in fixed income. Your views there, what about gold, other asset classes at a time when perhaps there's a recession looming in the US? Your thoughts? So, you know, when, when people look at asset allocation, and so let me again sort of look at it from my own personal lens, equities is clearly something that, you know, most youngsters, and I also started pretty uh, young uh, as far as equities went, but I didn't uh, sort of ever give up on fixed income because, uh, you know, the, the kind of comfort or the little bit of safety pot that one wants to create can be created quite uh, easily and conveniently through fixed income. 
Um, and uh, so I, I don't think I was ever 100% equities and, and zero debt. I always had uh, something in fixed income. And I want to say that ratio has changed over the years, but very consciously. Um, and, uh, you know, you're, you're, again, you're talking about equities and fixed income. Another very interesting asset class that has come up is that of alternates. And therefore, if you look at, say, uh, you know, things like REITs or you look at, uh, uh, you mentioned gold, uh, it, it could just be, uh, you know, any other real estate that one is looking at, hedge funds, long shots, all of that has also become a very interesting class. Um, but again, you know, while we typically talk about age, et cetera, et cetera, and risk taking ability, the truth is, and the honest truth is that when people do their risk profiling, they might think that they're very aggressive, uh, but very often they do not have the ability to stomach volatility. Okay. So I don't want to do any stereotyping here that, you know, in your younger ages, you should do this and you should not do that. I think it is different folks, uh, strokes for different folks. And, uh, you know, no one's sitting on a seat of judgment. But yes, very often uh, equities, just because by its very nature, one likes to invest for a slightly longer term perspective, the earlier you get in, the better. And uh, okay. might I just add, uh, you know, we should not forget what Einstein has taught us, and that is the power of compounding. And he calls it the eighth wonder of the world. And I may have said this on your show earlier, but I truly believe in it, that, you know, the, the, those who believe in it benefit from it, they earn it, and those who don't pay it. So just remember the power of compounding, and it only comes into play over longer periods of time. Okay, on that uh, wise note, and on those pearls of wisdom, we will let you go. Thanks a lot for joining us. And all the best. Uh, you've had a great journey so far, and Hope you continue to reach new heights. Thanks a lot, Jyotsna, for being with us on Smart Money. Thank you, Sonia. Been a pleasure. Well, with that, it's curtains down on another edition of Smart Money. Thanks a lot for watching.